There's really only one big story that everybody's talking about. Of course, I mean the Netflix documentary Tiger King. Did you watch uh, Tiger King? It has become the go-to binge watch during lockdown. Tiger King. Tiger King. Tiger King. Tiger King. Unless you've been living under a rock, you've heard of Netflix's Tiger King, Murder, Mayhem, and Madness the seven-part documentary series that monopolized Zoom conversations last month. Now, Tiger King isn't the first Netflix docuseries to go viral. It isn't even the first one in 2020. It comes hot on the heels of Cheer, a show that catapulted its stars into seemingly every talk show in existence. And Netflix isn't the only network or streaming service to produce documentary TV series recently. HBO has been creating documentaries like Leaving Neverland and Mommy Dead and Dearest even longer than Netflix, and had their own viral docuseries in 2015 called The Jinx. Since you're here at The Ringer, you're probably familiar with ESPN's lengthy Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. But something has set these Netflix series apart. Tiger King and Cheer were massive commercial successes despite being about obscure topics from little-known filmmakers. So what gives? How are these documentary series able to become briefly must-see television? Well, it's not just luck. I'm Jackson, and this is How Tiger King Went Viral. According to Netflix's letter to shareholders, more than 64 million unique households watched Tiger King in the first four weeks after its release. So to call Tiger King a hit is like calling Usain Bolt fast. It really just doesn't do it justice. And the fact that Tiger King managed to become this popular while being a documentary is mind blowing. I went to a hipster film school with a nationally renowned Quidditch program. And even we thought the people into documentaries were nerds. But over the past decade, documentary filmmaking has found a new level of popularity. Last year, Knock Down the House, the story of 2018 primary campaigns by progressives like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, was sold for $10 million to Netflix, a Sundance record. Won't You Be My Neighbor, They Shall Not Grow Old, and Free Solo, all released in 2018, place in the top 20 highest grossing documentaries of all time. There's a bigger appetite for documentaries now than ever before. And that boom is largely because of Netflix. Let's back up. Long-form journalism shows like 60 Minutes and Dateline NBC, the former of which has been around since the 1960s, were some of the first nonfiction programs to enjoy the mainstream success on television that would pave the way for modern docuseries. But while these types of shows told interesting stories, they were more famous for being pulpy gossip than worldwide or even nationwide phenomenon. It was a dead arm from a dead body. Oh, that's terrible. As podcasts exploded in popularity in the 2010s, so did the appetite for true crime stories. That allowed early viral docuseries to find their footing. HBO's The Jinx, which was about accused murderer Robert Durst, made major headlines when it captured a potential confession from its subject in 2015. And later that same year, Netflix dropped its own true crime documentary that would put the streamer's unscripted content on the map, making a murderer. It's hard to overstate how huge a swing for Netflix making a murderer was. The show was pitched in early 2013, when executive Lisa Nishimura sat down with filmmakers Laura Ricciardi and Moira Demos. Back then, House of Cards had only just debuted, Netflix's first foray into original programming of any kind. And investing in these first-time filmmakers was a far cry from investing in David freaking Fincher. But there was internal data at Netflix that showed audiences were eager to watch nonfiction series. DVD rentals and streams of documentaries were significant, and Nishimura told Vanity Fair that 75% of Netflix subscribers have watched a documentary on the service. So while box office numbers alone might have made documentaries seem like a gamble, Netflix could tell that, on the small screen, there was a market for this kind of storytelling. Making a Murderer went on to become a smash hit for the company, winning an Emmy for Best Documentary or Nonfiction Series. Since then, Netflix has dominated the documentary categories of award shows. They've won three of the last four Emmys in that category, already the second highest total for any network in the category's 22-year history, and has produced 35% of the category's nominees since it started winning. On the film side, Netflix has won two of the last five Best Documentary Feature Oscars, and has had 28% of the total nominees. All of which is to say, Nishimura's theory that people wanted to watch documentaries at home is looking pretty, pretty good. Netflix has fueled the appetite for nonfiction storytelling by delivering it to people in an accessible format, taking what was once a niche film genre and bringing it into the mainstream. But what does any of this have to do with Tiger King specifically? Tiger King is a different animal than the Netflix docs that came before it. And not just because it stars this rhinestone mulleted beast. 
Sure, Tiger King is true crime adjacent, but the allure of the show isn't in a whodunit. It's in basking in the absurdity of its characters. I'm broke as shit. I have a judgment against me from some bitch down there in Florida, and this is all paid for by the committee of Joe Exotic Speaks for America. Wow! Tiger King points to a paradigm shift at the heart of Netflix. Last year, Nishimura was promoted away from TV, as Netflix brought all of its unscripted TV content, reality, documentary, and competition under one department. And when we look at the last year in unscripted content for Netflix, the company's hot streak is even more impressive, touting other viral successes like the Queer Eye reboot, Tidying Up, The Circle, Love is Blind, and Too Hot to Handle. And Tiger King has just as much in common with those shows as it does with its docuseries predecessors, like Making a Murderer or Wild Wild Country. On the surface, Tiger King looks a lot like the true crime documentaries that dominated the mid-2010s. It has a real crime at its heart, its main character is in prison after being found guilty of 19 counts of federal crime. And while Joe Exotic definitely mistreated his animals, there's an uncertainty that he actually tried to hire someone to kill his nemesis, Carol Baskin. Do I believe that Joe hired someone to kill someone? No. No. Joe doesn't have that in him. One bit. But do I believe that Joe had a conversation with someone and said, man, I wish Carol was dead? Absolutely. One of the recent films most similar to Tiger King is HBO's Mommy Dead and Dearest, the you can't make this up true crime doc about Gypsy Rose Blanchard, an apparent invalid who orchestrated the murder of her mother after a lifetime of abuse. In both pieces, every time you think the story can't get any more unpredictable, they take a leap. What we thought initially may be a victim turns out to be a suspect and in the middle of this story that is twisted. But tonally, Tiger King is much more similar to Netflix's viral reality content than a docuseries about murder. Like Love is Blind, it's built on a ridiculous premise, subbing out getting married to someone you've never seen for a wild world of backyard exotic animal zoos in Oklahoma. Like Too Hot to Handle, it's too outlandish to be spoiled. It has to be seen to be believed. Tiger King is endlessly memeable in a way that puts Marie Kondo's I Love Mess to shame. Or the memes or memes or whatever they're called. But there's a deeper connection between Tiger King and Netflix's reality fair. Netflix's unscripted content in 2020 has taken on a voyeuristic feature. We're not expected to understand or relate to the show's characters, but instead to gawk at them. In Too Hot to Handle and The Circle, a narrator serves as someone between host and critic. The result makes you feel like you're on the edge of the party with them, making jokes about the drunken fools in front of you. Do whatever, kiss, feel, touch, smell, we can do whatever, and we gotta figure out who did what. Why not? Seems like the perfect icebreaker for a bunch of people who met nine hours ago. While there's no narrator in Tiger King, the same vibe exists. The show is an undeniable thrill ride of outrageous people and choices that are impossible to believe. So impossible to believe that you can almost feel the filmmakers turning to you with a Jim Halpert smirk and saying, can you believe this shit? This kind of genre-defying storytelling is at the heart of Netflix's strategy for creating content, both scripted and unscripted. In Vulture's 2018 story Inside the Binge Factory, writer Joseph Adelian learned that Netflix thinks about content in terms of what they call verticals and taste clusters. Verticals are like video tags, and taste clusters are Netflix's version of demographics, grouping people together by common cross-sections of consumption. For example, Black Mirror gets recommended to people who watch Shameless, Orphan Black, and The OA, shows without an obvious throughline. This is the same approach that helped Tiger King break through, sitting in the clusters of true crime docuseries, LGBTQ TV, and in the provocative investigative verticals. Netflix looks for and develops stories that cross-pollinate between multiple seemingly separate audiences. That gets the show in front of as many eyeballs as possible. And then the show invokes the internet nature of its most viral content, tapping into meme culture and actively dunking on its subjects like a Twitter prodigy. So how replicable is Tiger King really though? How can anything really follow this? I've had my days of coke, I had my days of drinking, I had my days of meth. And this is my mother-in-law, run! <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't note that Tiger King's rise to prominence coincided with this little phenomenon that's been happening that some scientists are calling a global pandemic or something. Coronavirus sent everyone into quarantine at the same moment that Tiger King hit the Netflix homepage and gave subscribers an opportunity for a communal experience. 
Nowhere was the connection between Tiger King and coronavirus more apparent than in the follow-up special hosted by Joel McHale that took place entirely within video chat. You know, just like the rest of human interaction these days. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's me, Joel McHale. And as you're all aware, we're currently in the midst of a global pandemic, Tiger King fever. Global lockdown has been good for business at Netflix so far, which just recorded its best quarter, adding 15 million subscribers in quarter one of 2020. Just a few months ago, industry experts were wondering aloud if Netflix might be doomed in the streaming wars, as rival companies started the process of pulling their content off the service. I don't think they're going anywhere, but I do think that they're kind of stuck in this place where like, they have to like navigate a bunch of possible futures and many of them end catastrophically. But the launches of Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus did little to dent Netflix's lead. And it's become clear that Netflix's institutional momentum is a force to be reckoned with. Global lockdown has only cemented the Netflix approach, and their head start is growing larger and larger by the day. So why was Tiger King a smash success? The short answer is Netflix. At this moment, a show on Netflix has a higher ceiling in terms of viral success than any other streaming service or network. They have the most subscribers, and they know how to get their content in front of the right people to take a show from incubation to internet domination. Tiger King might not be, critically speaking, a better television show than Making a Murderer, or even Cheer for that matter, but Tiger King is optimized. It succeeds because of Netflix's savvy business strategy. It succeeds by blurring the lines between reality TV and true crime documentaries. It succeeds by being uniquely suited to the internet. Too outrageous to be spoiled, but so unbelievable that it can't not be memed. Carol Baskin killed her husband, whacked him. Can't convince me that it didn't happen. There have been a lot of TV shows on Netflix before Tiger King. Shows that could have found a home on FX, Bravo, or Adult Swim. But Tiger King is the first show that is truly a product of Netflix's unique capabilities. The first show truly integrated into the sensibilities of the internet at a time when life has moved completely online. 